You're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Hey, thank you for joining us here on the Chris Spangle Show. My name is Chris Spangle. It's so great to have you with us. I am very excited to talk today to James Chernowski, who gave me a, a pronunciation guide before. All my listeners know I'm just not good. So did I do okay, James? Oh, yeah, you're doing great. All right, good. All right. James is James Chernowski is a policy analyst at the Libertas Institute, a free market think tank in Utah. He writes about consumer privacy, cybersecurity, and technology and innovation issues. His work has been published in Real Clear Future, The Morning Consult, The Deseret News, Sun Salt Lake Tribune. He is also a Young Voices contributor. Are you still out at the Libertas Institute? I know you moved to D.C. But is yeah, that uh, <laughs> I used to be at the Libertas Institute, but now I work at Americans for Prosperity. I do all their tech and innovation policy, but I love my time at Libertas. They're a great bunch. Explain to me what a policy analyst is. Let's just go like real basic for listeners. I, I, of course, understand. But for the other people who don't get it, what do you do all day? Do you just sit around and read? Oh, man, I wish. <laughs> I wish I could just sit around and read all day. Uh, unfortunately, the world does not like to go at that kind of a pace, uh, though I do definitely do a substantial amount of reading as a policy analyst. I also am constantly meeting with people and and uh, looking at new pieces of legislation that are occurring at the state or federal level to vet them, to see how they line up with my organization's values and my values and offer recommendations to either improve the legislation if it's something that's workable or to go and just have a position where we think that it's something that's not workable and we're opposed to it and being able to explain why we have the position that we have. So with policy analyst analysis, basically what you're doing is you're you're not only being up to speed with everything that's going on in your field, uh, which in technology is quite broad sometimes, but you're also responsible for actually getting a little bit into the into the dirt there and checking out what's actually going on in terms of legislative proposals that are being considered uh, by legislatures and Congress. Yeah, sometimes we watch like, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg. If you remember, you're we're probably roughly the same age. Yeah. The Alaskan senator. The Internet is a series of tubes <laughs> yeah. uh, and they really haven't seemed to advance to a higher level of understanding of the Internet, despite its massive complexity through its growth over the last 30 years. So I think we had to reschedule this because you were going to speak to Congress or you're going to the Capitol or you're going to Capitol Hill for something. You know, what what kind of uh, level of understanding do you find in people who are trying to make regulations in this area? Yeah, I think it's a very fair question. It depends on the individual member and their staff and and whether we're talking about the federal or state level. Some people are a lot more knowledgeable than others, but more often than not, there's definitely some basic educational component that has to be done. Uh, you know, you mentioned Mark Zuckerberg and the Internet as a series of tubes, but it wasn't that long ago that we had Senator Richard Blumenthal actually treating the notion of Finsta as an actual product of Facebook, uh, the company, and trying to get the company to commit to ending For general. our older listeners, that's a private Instagram. That the, the kids call it a Finsta. I have a Finsta. Uh, yeah, yeah. Private right. family. But it's not a product. It's just a second account. Yeah, it's just a, it's a private profile. It's not necessarily tied to anybody particularly, right? And, and it was just a concept that was over his head and it was it was entertaining for those of us that are in that space to watch that kind of unfold but at the same time it's also a little alarming because as you indicated sometimes these individuals are responsible for having a vote to think about this kind of legislation in this space and what that means so uh, it, it makes my job very important in the sense of being able to explain why the things that they're trying to do might not necessarily tackle the issues they've identified whether it's with finsta or with some of the things like Earn an Act we're trying to address, there, there's always something going on where that requires a lot more nuance and conversation. And that's where I think policy analysts are underappreciated sometimes because we can come in there and certainly, I think, uh, you know, fill in some of those gaps that, that people don't understand. And we're not coming in as, you know, lobbyists. We're just coming in as subject matter experts. And I think that that's a, a much better position to be in. So like, do you have the old SNL, Jane, you ignorant slut moment, like when you're talking to somebody, how do you delicately say to one of these folks? Because I imagine that you're probably like meeting them in their office or is it in committee meetings on C-SPAN or like when you're having the interaction with a, a congressperson, how do you delicately say, yeah, but you don't know what you're talking about. So don't do that. 
Yeah, I think it's more just about, you know, avoiding ad hominems. You don't want to sit there and obviously insult anybody. I think it's more important to just focus on the actual policy prescription and the idea and being able to highlight within the text what is being written out and how you're interpreting that to be in terms of the implication of the legislation. And just focusing on policy, I think, and leading with policy is a critical value when you're trying to figure out how you want to go and address what you view as a bad idea. And Lord knows that there's plenty of bad bills out there for different reasons. But, you know, if we went going and calling everybody names because they introduced a bad idea, uh, we probably wouldn't have all that many offices taking our calls either. So I think it's just trying to strike a right balance between, you know, calling out bad ideas when you see them for sure, but also understanding that at the end of the day, it's not with bad intention always. It's more about trying to tackle a particular issue, understanding what drove them to that, and then being able to explain how their idea doesn't necessarily achieve that stated outcome, right? So that's what I'm more focused on, is how can we redirect that energy into more productive uses of time that can benefit the American taxpayer that's expecting you know, members of Congress or their state legislatures to engage in a variety, a wide variety of topics. Now, listener, I heard him say he doesn't engage in ad hominem attacks against Congress people. So, James, are you libertarian? Yeah, I think I think in general I'm pretty just libertarian. Kidding. Yeah, yeah, but you are a libertarian based on your reading. But yeah, that's just like the feature. It's like they get amped up and start name calling. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's something that I try to distinctly avoid because it doesn't benefit us at all when we're engaging in that space. And I'd rather people listen to me uh, because I'm coming in with a thoughtful idea. Uh, or trying to at least think and work with them in terms of how we want to solve this issue, whether it's with Earned Act trying to deal with CSAM material, which I think a lot of people, including libertarians, would find uh, as disturbing content that we wouldn't want to see on the internet or have people purvey that uh, in terms of distribution. Uh, but I think that we can also go and debate about the merits of that legislation in a quite honest manner. And that's always where I will come from. I have no problem being an honest shooter and agreeing on principle in terms of what the, the goal is uh, more often than not, if I can. So let's start there. Let's, uh, I was going to start with Bitcoin and Bitcoin regulation, but you mentioned, is it CSAC? First explain what that is. And then you kind of mentioned, you know, well, we don't want to see certain things on some of these different platforms. And, you know, Elon Musk bought Twitter because he wants it to be a maximally free speech zone, which I've been on Gab and I don't know that I want that, but I also, <laughs> think sunshine is the best disinfectant for a lot of different things i've also read about different you know people who are uh, uh, facebook monitors they last there for like three months and need a lifetime of ptsd therapy after what they've seen uh, as to what gets moderated yeah um, so <laughs> what what it, legislation is being crafted around this and how big of a task do you think elon musk has in terms of moderating a lot of yeah, I think that's a great set of questions in terms of uh, answering some of them. CSAM is child sexual abuse material. This is obviously like child pornography and nude imagery of children. Things of that nature get categorized in this, this topic of CSAM pretty broadly. The legislation that was most notoriously tied to this concept was Earn It Act, uh, which aimed to go and do a carve out to Section 230 which is an, uh, a piece of legislation that basically says that if you are a website, you are not liable for third party content <clears throat> that is on your website. Uh, that is because of a whole series of other events that are interesting that we could spend an entire podcast talking about. But basically that's the general premise. Uh, the, the reality is, is that again, no one disagrees with that. I think that these platforms are actually doing a lot to go and tackle that information. And to your point, I think legislation like this assumes that we can just either like nerd our way out of it or just hire more people, throw more money at it. And sometimes, you know, that's just not always possible from the private sector in terms of making it realistic. I mean, Facebook by itself or Meta now uh, has over 30,000 people in its employ that deal with content moderation decisions on their own and review content all the time. And it is very taxing on somebody from a mental health standpoint to look at some of the most you know, disgusting pieces of imagery on the internet that can be out there that we can't even conceive because we don't see it 99.9% .9 of the time. These people actually do get to go and see all that and flag it and report it. And there's all kinds of stressors that come with that. And some people will say, well, maybe we should go and up it on the technology side, put more algorithms on it. Except the problem with algorithms is that it's not perfect. They're designed by humans and it's only as good as the information that you're putting in there. So what are the risks and the trade-offs that come with these different policies matter? 
So when Earn It Act got introduced, there was actually some very legitimate privacy concerns that would be coming out there. And the argument that I found personally most compelling is that with that particular piece of legislation, it was trying to be you know, pretty crafty about it, but the problem ultimately was is that it would basically deputize private companies to do the things that the government could not do, and it'd be a violation of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. So you faced a, a whole new set of problems as a result of that. And I think that you know, we deserve better than that. Now, as you mentioned, Elon did buy Twitter. He does want that to be more open. He's not going to be having those kinds of problems. It is something that he has to address when it comes to making sure that kind of content is not disseminated on Twitter in an open manner. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, I think that it will be something that remains to be seen because we don't even know if he's going to actually buy it yet or not. Twitter is holding his feet to the fire and trying to force him to go through with this deal. But uh, we know that he's been trying to hold it up with this conversation surrounding bots. So that's something that remains to be seen. So when you I, I've been a critic of Facebook's moderation because I've I mean, I've tried to build a career through these platforms and the moderation through AI has become impossible. I mean, the the, you know, getting a group banned for a meme that you posted five years ago versus, you know, and I, I get I get uh, deleted in algorithms for. You know, bleach jokes in 2020 that were very clearly jokes, right? Or, you know, or you'll see people just with the most benign meme get banned for 30 days because they posted it in 2017. Like, um, the, the Facebook is the worst. I've I've not had any issues with um Twitter, uh, and YouTube when they've stricken me, it's been fair, pretty fair, a fair deal. Um, hey, this is, you know, even though we were doing like a, an insurrection breakdown and we opposed it and we were like, this is all bad. They were like, you played this video and, and you shouldn't have. Um, I, I, I guess I don't agree with that. Right. Like I was trying to it was a newsworthy thing. But OK, from your perspective, I get it. Whereas Facebook and Instagram, it's just it. There's no rhyme or reason to it. And it started over the last like. Like few months creeping into my normie friends who are not trying to be edgy. They're just like, what? what is Facebook doing? So I get your point about 30,000 people can't police. I mean, I could imagine like in, in, in a place like uh, Malaysia or the Philippines where you just don't have enough people that speak the language to do moderation. The task is near impossible. So you build these AI systems to kind of weed it out. But these these tools, are they going to find a better way to kind of balance between letting people have fun on their platform and stay? Or is it just going to continue down this path where the amount of unlikes on pages is unreal? People are just quitting the platform left and right. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a fair question in general, right? Because I certainly share your view that I don't approve of all the decisions that Facebook at all have made at times, whether it's come to Jan 6 or to political advertisements or the Hunter Biden story. I explicitly wrote about that when they when they did their takedown of the Hunter Biden story uh, for their reasons with trying to avoid any kind of problems with the election interference uh, claims. Ironically enough, that's all because of 2016 and Hillary Clinton with the servers. So like, there's not a surprise here that you know there these these companies are kind of caught in a catch 22. If you take something down, you're damned. If you leave something up, you're damned. Somebody's always going to be angry at you for what you did or did not do. So <clears throat> I can certainly empathize with why it's difficult in that respect. Um, it is their right to make it. It is our responsibility as users of the platform to call it out en masse. And I think that we're starting to get there. We're starting to see that a little bit more, whether that's with Dave Chappelle and the way that he's handling his stuff with Netflix. Uh, Ricky Gervais had a similar thing pop up recently because he had his special, which, by the way, had knee and stitches. So I, I certainly empathize with the ability for people to want to be able to go and have a wider range of discussion on these platforms, uh, but it is their private property. They reserve the right to do it. And ultimately what the right answer is, is going to be on a case by case basis per platform. I think that the best option that you have is to go and break down this top down content moderation method, more decentralized in nature, make it towards the user and community based style of content moderation. So the joke is always that it sounds like I'm advocating for Reddit for all of these uh, platforms. And in some ways you are, uh, but sometimes it's also through protocols themselves and the algorithms and the, on the construction side for how we want them to go and engage in behavior. But again, it's more done from a community design aspect where it's more localized in nature, which means that 
people can actually kind of go and, you know, tailor the internet to what their interests and beliefs are. Uh, that way we're not having this conflict where we're seeing increasing polarization between what either side thinks should or should not be up. I think that's a great point. You know, the, the Reddit model, and I know that there have been, certainly been what was the big Donald Trump one got banned and yeah. there, there, there is. And that just is the I'm not a, one of the oh, everybody's woke uh, podcasters, but there's yeah. certainly a left leaning bias, um, which, you know, I, I don't I don't you, I guess that's part of the appeal of Elon Musk, right, is that he's going to go in and he'll fire everybody that's woke and uh, build it, build a Twitter for a real free speech. And the, I just don't. Like the more you introduce politics, maybe you can speak on this, but I would think that what you're talking about legislation is not going to fix that problem of AI freaking out or not enough people moderating or Hillary Clinton got robbed. And like, but neither is trying to come at it from all these different political perspectives. Like, uh, when you look at the political bias game that is always played about these different platforms, do you see it like, oh, this is definitely they have an agenda or you just like the problem is so massive it can't be solved. Yeah. I think that when it comes to the notion of, of political biases at these companies, obviously it's hard to say that the companies themselves do not employ, uh, you know, an uneven number of Democrats, the Republicans ratio, but there are numerous reasons why that happens. And some of that's just the way that the demographics split out. If you're higher educated on average, you're probably going to be a little bit more left leaning. That's one. If you're higher income, you're probably going to be a little bit more left leaning. Like these things don't have to typically work in favor of conservatives all the time. Uh, so that's why it's not necessarily surprising to me to see that the employee, you know, donation stuff that's been reported comes out the way it does. That being said, in terms of how the content itself gets handled on the platforms, there's no empirical evidence that can go and suggest that it's necessarily biased in nature. So I'll, I'll give you an example real fast. So like, again, you'll hear Daily Wire at all talk about how they are, you know, getting shadow banned or whatever. But typically also on the other so flip, on the flip side of this, they're also some of the highest performing pages on the platform for Meta for Facebook without the Internet. You know, Ben Shapiro does not have his multi-million dollar media empire that he has now to go and combat the woke culture that that he's complaining about. Look at the uh, podcast charts. It's mostly yeah. conservative talk radio, you know, in yeah. the podcast charts in the news section for sure. You know, and yeah. I, I'm I know that they're censoring podcasts and they're going to increase it. But, yeah, I mean, there's there's still yeah. free speech. It's yeah. So I think at the end of the day, it's still private property. So these companies get to exert that to a degree. And again, when it happens, it's just important that we understand that what has happened and that we go and, and hold them accountable to it. And again, sometimes it is something as benign as the algorithm made a mistake and it went and took something down preemptively when it shouldn't have. And it could be something that's simple. But the other example that I'll go to as well is like, OK, so they talk about the, the latest one was this uh, Gmail spam filter problem where, it, you know, conservatives looked at this study that was done and then claimed that because the study found that conservative emails are ending up in spam. They thought that it was evidence that Google was censoring conservatives for their donor emails that they were sending out to people that were using Gmail. That's not what the study was saying. What the study was saying was that they were more likely to get flagged as spam and appear in a spam folder. And that had to do with language that was being used in the emails, et cetera. And on the flip side, if you were using like Yahoo or Outlook, uh, liberal uh, donor emails tended to go into spam more than conservative. So it's like, it's more of like, you have to understand the rhetoric that you're using, the language that you're using in these communique and how to tailor it appropriately. And yeah, maybe there is something to be said about how we can, you know, try to communicate better with the respective political parties so that these things don't happen. But to pretend that it's because it's out of an animus for censorship, I think is, is a misunderstanding. I go back to the old Michael Jordan saying if Republicans buy sneakers too, Republicans do add, <laughs> add emails as well and they have money value to these companies. So it's not in their best interest to go and shut off what amounts to, you know, at the end of the day, a significant portion of the American populace. So I think that we can certainly have a better conversation about how we can try to have more open channels of communication without, you know, leveling to this. I think no legislative answer right now that's been proposed has really satisfied my concerns because the problem is, is that you can do any of these things that conservatives or liberals want when it comes to the internet. Typically, we see this in the form of Section 230 bills. But the problem is, is that even if we did repeal 230 outright, it doesn't, it, number one, it'll entrench any of the big companies that are there because they can afford all the litigation costs that come from it. And that's why I'm usually not a fan of repealing 230. But then two, on the flip side, 
I think the other problem that you have is that while there's this cultural rift that's going on right now, where conservatives and liberals are increasingly polarized and they're not agreeing on things and they're increasing in hateful rhetoric towards one another, as long as that problem persists and there's not a unity in the country in general in terms of where we want to go, then I think that it doesn't matter what we do legislatively because that underlying problem is still there and it's going to continue to fester. And that needs to be addressed. And you can't legislate culture, unfortunately. Like you've got to, you got to, you got to sit down at a table and work it out. Yeah, I think at some point you're going to. I mean, we're already kind of at two distinct cultures. Like the Daily Wire, in my mind, has the ability and capital to build their own Facebook. You've seen Bongino build Rumble, and that you know started out wonky, and now it's it's become a solid competitor. And that's because there's enough people willing to walk away from these bigger platforms and use something different. And, you know, it's not just kind of a tiny niche thing like in the in the um, about five years ago, you'd always get new new um, new uh, social media startups. And it just you didn't have anything going on at some of those places. Like, I, I don't know that I checked me we in a while, um, but you could have some of these entertainment brands, these media brands start to build out stuff that has can effectively become competitors. But it, like you said, it becomes insanely harder if you entrench their position through legislation which i'm guessing that's kind of what Mar mark zuckerberg wants yeah i mean if you're if you're meta i mean they ran campaign ads for a significant portion of time talking about how they were amenable to section 230 reforms that's not for no small reason in particular it is because at the end of the day they think that with a reform to 230 if they say that they're open to it they can be at the table for that legislation that's written and they can be written in a way that could potentially benefit meta at the end of the day, uh, which will make it harder for startups and smaller companies to be uh, able to enter into this field and, and really disrupt it. And I really think that that part is the one that needs to be emphasized double, because right now, I think that there's this snapshot that we've taken on the Internet, kind of like how we did back when there was MySpace or AOL, where we just think that these are the ones that are going to stand the test of time. And that's just not guaranteed. AOL, Yahoo, they sold collectively for $3 billion when they used to be worth individually over $100 billion uh, as individual companies. They were both very successful, right? MySpace, everybody thought it would be the next big thing. It went defunct and it got sold for pennies on the dollar. So there's nothing that's set in stone, nothing that's guaranteed in a digital ecosystem. That's what makes it so competitive. And I think that the problem is, is that if if you're looking at this ecosystem, it's strided pretty heavily towards younger people. So when I'm talking about my, my, my grandma and grandpa, we're lucky if a plurality of that generation actually uses Facebook, maybe YouTube if we're lucky. But as we get younger and younger and younger, there's actually a lot of dynamism that's there in terms of the number of platforms that we're engaging in, what kinds of platforms, where we're going to get the content that we're looking for, where we're going to shop. Right. People thought Amazon was going to be this monopoly, but we've seen Shopify, you know, ignore the current market conditions right now with the stock market. But like that's actually emerged as a legitimate competitor to Amazon and they're losing market share every single year uh, to these other emerging ones. So I think that we've always got to keep that in mind. Nothing set in stone, but legislation can very easily lock in incumbents. And we have to be mindful of that. Good old creative destruction. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up on this part and I'll ask you, does Elon go through with buying Twitter? It, you know, what's his game? Why is he quibbling on the bots? And if he does, as I saw one person on Twitter say, save Western civilization, if, if so. <laughs> uh, you know, I think I, I personally do believe that ultimately Elon will buy Twitter. I think that his, his hang up with the bots is a matter of literally just splitting hairs as to what you want the number of bots and fake accounts as a representation of Twitter users to be. Um, I think that, you know, while Twitter says it's less than 5%, the study that Elon wanted to go and reference was near 20%. It's probably neither of those numbers. It's probably somewhere in between. The reason why he's skittish on it is that if there's more fake users than what he was led to believe, then that could harm the actual value he could generate out of the platform. And that was what would have him think about backing out. The problem is that if he backs out, it's not like he just pays the billion dollar breakup fee. Then he faces a whole host of other legal action that'll go against him. And it'll cost him a lot of money. So I think for him, ultimately, it still is the best course of action to just pony up, pay the money. If you care about free speech as much as you care about, and you're the third richest man in the world or the richest man in the world, um, you know, I think that that's, a, that's something that really, I don't think, matters in the scheme of things to him, uh, especially because he has outside investors and, and whatnot coming through. So 
I'm, I'm pretty confident it'll get done, but we'll, we'll see. So, uh, Bitcoin is always, uh, you know, I just, I laughed when I saw the head, I think of the EU say, you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is a nothing. It's a joke, but we really need to regulate it, which seems like a contradictory position to me. <laughs> you, get the, you know, the, uh, you always have sort of these elitist circles talking about how we need to regulate crypto. You see it in the American, you know, the American Congress, um, and the volatility of Bitcoin and the crypto markets right now don't help that argument as you see stories of, oh, Dale lost $37,000 as whole life savings in crypto, which that's on Dale. Dale shouldn't have done that. But, you know, w what do you think the chances of real solid regulation in crypto, like, like what, give me a percentage of crypto regulation and what that might look like. Yeah, so I think it's funny, right? Uh, Congress never really thought about crypto seriously until it became a $3.6 trillion market. And then, <laughs> as the old saying goes, you know, Uncle Sam wanted his, you know, wanted his cut. So, uh, you know, there's there's always an opportunity to make money out of it. So that's why when we saw, uh, you know, the, the infrastructure bill originally drop, it had some crypto language in there. Uh, we've seen it pop up numerous times where Congress is trying to figure out ways of paying for legislation uh, by taxing crypto, uh, treating it like a security so that we can go and leverage, you know, security gains, uh, taxes on it, etc. So it's not surprising that Congress is looking to go and act to regulate it. It's not surprising that the world is looking to go and regulate it. Uh, as it becomes more legitimate in nature, it just offers an opportunity uh, to threaten their respective domestic currencies. So I, I don't necessarily blame them for wanting to think about that in terms of how regulation will develop across the EU. I'm sure it will take uh, a less friendly direction in general. I think that, you know, that's certainly likely <laughs> for the kind of regulation that we'll see uh, if we're looking at any of indication of how they're treating the rest of the, the internet. When it comes to US, uh, for crypto broadly, the chances of legislation as of this moment does not seem like too broad uh, likely when we're talking about cryptocurrencies themselves. That being said, where there does seem to be the most amount of appetite for regulation seems to be with a, with a subset of cryptocurrencies uh, known as stable coins, which is where the coin itself, the cryptocurrency, is pegged to the value of a U.S. dollar. So that way it's always trading at one to one and trying to make sure that there are regulations and guardrails in place uh, for the use of stable coins. Uh, and when you look at what happened with Terra Luna, for example, where the value dropped significantly, that's usually uh, why people want to go and look at regulating this space. I think that they always talk about responsible uh, innovation. I would prefer to see responsible regulation from the government. Uh, that's just my personal opinion, but we'll see what happens ultimately. I think that the stable coin route's the most likely in the near future. Yeah, the, the resp responsible legislation, good one. Uh, <laughs> but I get, what, I get what you're saying in that, like, it's always on the innovator that has to be responsible and, and never the government, which comes in and, and causes all these trade-offs that cause issues or does things that don't work. Um, see gun legislation. But if, if you get the UK regulating cryptocurrency, you know, China's, I think they've all but banned it. Right. But, you know, but it still exists. But if you start to like GDPR, if you start getting Europe or, UK starting to regulate some of that stuff. Does that start to creep into what we can do here with it? Absolutely. Uh, that, that's probably one of the biggest problems in general with international, uh, you know, laws conflicting with one another. Uh, GDPR for consumer data privacy was a mess. I hate those cookie notifications. So thank you, Europe. Everybody hates you for the cookie notifications. But that's where that's literally the the one thing that I think everybody knows about GDPR is the cookie notification. Uh, actually, I think the UK is a little bit better on crypto than people give it credit for. Uh, they've been pretty flexible and forward looking with respect to fintech, particularly which leverages blockchain technologies. So I think that they're trying to figure out how they can be better than the EU has historically been. Um, but it can create a lot of problems. What China did was they did ban mining Bitcoin and dealing with cryptocurrencies in China, but they want to promote their digital yuan. That's their long-term play to try to sit there and undermine the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. And it's not necessarily an idle threat either. We just came out not that long ago of the Saudis looking at possibly doing an oil deal with the Chinese in the digital yuan over the U.S. dollar. 
when a, a significant portion of the sales of oil around the globe are done in the U.S. dollar. Uh, so every little thing counts at the end of the day. And that's why it's important that the United States, you know, needs to be proactive in terms of thinking about how we can set this up in a pro-innovation pro permissionless innovation kind of fashion where we can rather than stymie the industries that are emerging right now in this space we can support them and help them flourish and get the talented people that can support that industry here into the united states over our you know counterparts that are around the world that are interested in trying to get this you know industry in their in their domestic area how how cautious should people i've only ever used coinbase yeah um and knowing full well, I just I just played around with it. I, I don't even think I have. I may have like one hundred and twenty dollars in Ethereum that I can't get out of Coinbase. Um, <laughs> so I'm I'm no like crypto investor. I'm the idiot that uh, back in 2013 was offered a Bitcoin for an interview and said, no, I don't get it. This is stupid. <laughs> not not that I would have kept it to sixty three thousand. I would have sold it at two thousand. But um you know, when you're looking at investing in crypto, how aware should you be that you may not own some of this stuff? It's like buying paper gold. Yeah, I think that that's that's one of the trickiest parts about about the crypto versus gold uh, in the monetary policy conversation in general. Right. Is that Bitcoin is often referred to as like that digital gold standard uh, that people want to see emerge. But the problem is, is that, like you noted, it's not like it's. It's something that's tangible where you can go to a bank and they can give you a Bitcoin gold coin or something. No, it's just a digital currency that has a medium of exchange that people have agreed to is valued at the price that Bitcoin is trading at at that particular moment in time. So there is some intricacies that are involved there, but that's why it depends on the user. Right. And I think that the speculation that came when they allowed for investors to get into the game of crypto rather than it just being, you know, the niche community that it was that was involved in that space prior to that has certainly added a little bit extra uh, volatility to the coins themselves that weren't there previously. Um, but, you know, that being said, I think if anyone's going to operate in this space, that's totally fine. But I think it's most important that they just engage in some basic financial literacy before they engage in any kind of investing. Uh, that's just something that I grew up on when I was going through the process of learning how to invest my money. Uh, I own cryptocurrencies as well uh, as a part of my investment strategy. But I think that if you don't have any understanding of, of what that financial literacy looks like and why that financial discipline matters, um, you know, then that makes it harder for you because then when you see the price of Ethereum tank from $4,400 to $1,900, you're freaking out. You want that money out like now. Uh, and for me, I'm just going to sit there and hold. I'm not really caring. I'm not going to need, you know, that, money that I invested in Ethereum back then right this second because I had the financial literacy to give me the discipline that saved the money to invest it accordingly. So I think that that's the biggest thing in general is just teaching people basic financial literacy so that they can afford to support what they're trying to do when it comes to growing their their wealth through this investment process that has really benefited a lot of people over the generations. Yeah, I mean, you can educate gamblers all you want, but you know, like me, I was gambling. <laughs> and in some cases I lost some, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I think people just need to be free to make their own choices and decisions because the sooner you, you jump in to try and save people from themselves, the worse you're going to make it. It, it. Then you take the whole thing away, which is, you know, maybe in some cases the, the reason they want to do it. Yeah, of course. You're absolutely right. It only takes one bad apple to ruin it for everybody. Right. I think that people like to look at the worst case scenario and use that as the justification for the overreach that comes out of that from the regulations that they're trying to promulgate, whatever it might be. It's because there was, you know, these lone, you know, what represented a real minority of cases. But that's what led them to doing what they're doing, because they didn't want those people to suffer in the way that they did. But I, again, I'd argue if you were better educated on the financial literacy side, that you'd understand how to take those those gambles and make them a little bit more palatable, right? I'm not throwing $10,000 into Ethereum and just leaving $10,000 in Ethereum. I have, I have some money in Ethereum. I have some money in traditional equities. I might have some things in bonds, right? I, I spread out, I diversify to mitigate the risk profiles that come with those different types of investments, right? And if you can do that, then, you know, people aren't going to be as worse of a position because they accidentally put $10,000 into Bitcoin when it was at $60,000 and now it's all the way down at 28, 29. Uh, and they're sitting there like sweating because they've lost $5,000 plus in the span of only a couple of months. And that's a very scary, you know, thought for somebody to have. 
Yeah, don't use your last dollar to gamble. <laughs> All right, uh, James Trunowski, Young Voices contributor. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the program and tell people where they can follow you and read your work. Yeah, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at JamesCZ19. That's where I'll go and post my musings and any of my latest work. I also have a personal website at jamesstranowski.com, which I typically update from time to time with any interviews and articles that I've written, etc. So look forward to continuing the conversation elsewhere. All right, James, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our listeners. We appreciate you. And if you learn something, then please share this episode with your friends and family. It's a great way to support what we're doing here. And we will see you again soon.